little bit about uh, Dr. Uh, Brandon Bellendorf. Dr. Bellendorf is a assistant professor at the University of Albany in, within the College of Emergency Preparedness, Homeland Security, and Cybersecurity. And uh, you'll see from Meet the Researcher, his uh, research focuses on a number of, of themes, including geospatial modeling of criminal and terrorist activity, network vulnerabilities of illicit traffic networks, game theoretic approaches to voter security, public perceptions of security related authorities. On that, but it's really his work on network vulnerabilities of illicit traffic and networks that, that actually bring him here. On that, and to, uh, near the end of, the, of this, what, which is, I think is very unique for Dr. Bellendorf, is that he was an operation analyst for the Ohio State uh, Highway Patrol. On that, as, as you may have seen in previous symposiums or, or maybe interactions with other universities or with this university, is that there's a tendency of being very academic on, on many of these things. On that. And you'll hear part of that because he is an academic, right? On that, on that, but he also has some some practical experience working within a law enforcement entity to be able to do that. So, what we ask Brandon to do is not to treat this like a lecture, and for you not to sit there as students treat it like a lecture. It's more of a conversation on that. That maybe he'll be able to highlight some points, and I think he would appreciate uh, some interactions, questions throughout. Feel free to ask questions throughout. There are going to be segments that say Q&A, they're uh, fully uh, uh, dedicated for that. And, uh, um, but please don't feel like you have to wait near the end. If there's a question like, uh, uh, like to ask of, of uh, Dr. Mellendorf, please ask. Um, that, that the whole idea is that you, you gain some benefit from this, the interaction, as opposed to sit, sit here uh, for a few hours and, 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 uh, and, and listen to something. So I would encourage you to do so. And uh, as we listen through that, um, you, you never know when, when the opportunity is to actually get a UTIP challenge coin. So I'll, I'll look at, I'll hear the questions and listen to the questions and I'll gauge uh, 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 how the challenge coins will go out on the stuff. So with that, I would love to uh, bring up Dr. Brandon Bellendorf here. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Chief. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, I've uh, developed an affection for El Paso. I was down here in June as well for another event. Can everyone hear me clearly on the uh, microphones? My wife tells me I talk very loud, so it shouldn't be a problem on there. Speaking of my wife, I want to, before I begin, thank her for allowing me to come down and do this presentation while she's taking care of my three boys under the age of four who are recovering from croup. So, uh, yes, uh, I want to publicly thank her because I know it's being webcasted. Uh, so she knows that in front of a, a live audience. Um, so as uh, Chief Manjares was uh, mentioning, you know, my name is Brandon Bill. I'm from the University of Albany. We are part of the uh, first college, entire college devoted to homeland security, emergency preparedness, cybersecurity in the nation. Uh, it's up in, uh, we're about three years. We're into our third year and we already have about... 400 students that are majoring in our undergraduate program uh, and we're actually adding an information and data visualization component as we speak so there's a lot of things that we're doing that you may find of interest and a lot of things that we're doing that uh, i'd be happy to talk with you afterwards about but uh, i can't be here and not plug my uh, home institution but today i want to really get to the kind of what we're talking about which is dismantling and disrupting transnational criminal organizations this is the hot, sexy topic that we all love and we all are working on in some capacity here and have some level of familiarization with or some, a lot of uh, in-depth expertise. But what I hope to go through today is talk to you a little bit about where the science is on this and where there are key gaps and limitations that without an ability from your agencies and your positions to partner on, will leave that science kind of falling behind the way that TCOs adapt and adopt and operate and innovate in that capacity. And so I hope to end on an, a, a proposal to you uh, through about how to develop mutual partnerships with academics to push this forward. So a little bit of an outline, uh, as Chief Manhar has mentioned, we have a couple of Q&A sessions within the presentation, but also this is informal. If you have a question during the presentation, feel free to ask it. I'll just repeat your question so those that are webcast can hear it um, if they can't hear it uh, from the audience. But I want this to be a conversation. No one likes sitting through two hours of a, of a lecture. I don't like doing that. My students don't like doing that. So I want this to be a conversation. So if you see questions or you need better clarification, feel free to raise your hand in that capacity and we'll talk about it. But I want to provide a little bit of introduction, kind of the purpose today, but I also want to uh, socialize you to a project that was funded by DHS Component that uh, we titled the Failure Points Project. I'll get into uh, a little bit uh, more in depth, but it's really focused on transnational criminal organizations 
and try and understand why they fail, which is different than how to interdict them, and we'll talk about that. And then I want to highlight kind of from a scientific perspective, what do we know or mostly know at this point? Now again, some of this may seem common sense. In fact, a lot of science ends up confirming what you already know anecdotally through your own investigations, right? So in some of this you may say, we know this already, we know this, I thought it was going to be all new things. But it's better to actually confirm some of the aspects and some of the tactics that you're taking and some of the strategies you're employing. And that's one way that science has been there to try to move that force. So there are some things, especially when it comes to leadership targeting and understanding how organizations adapt, that, we, that science knows or mostly knows, but it still has lots of room for improvement. And then the second half, we're going to take about what are we still learning? What don't we really know yet? And we found some things in this project on failure points that I think are going to be of interest and relevance to your, uh, your particular uh, um, uh, responsibilities and roles with encountering TCOs, but also understanding concepts like resilience and how networks survive or fail but how supply chains may continue on and one of the, some of the challenges there. And then I'm going to end with an opportunity to identify kind of how we move forward. So what's the purpose of today? What do I want to accomplish, right? Uh, I'm always a fan of tell them what you're going to say, say it, and then tell them what you told them. So today, this is, think of this as a short course on disrupting and dismantling TCOs from a scientific perspective, right? There are things, there are details that are not going to be presented here that you have from your own investigative capabilities that you could add in and flesh out. But in a two-hour period, there's only so much that we can cover. I want to provide just an overview, some key concepts, some key aspects, and where the science is on this so you can see where the work that you do fits within that particular scientific paradigm. But I also want to bring awareness to those key limitations as well, what we don't know, and then identify a pathway forward through a mutual partnership. So a couple of def key definitions I want to highlight here. First, when we talk about TCOs, when we talk about illicit networks, there's a lot of confusion about what exactly that entails. And I want to highlight kind of a tripartite, a three-way view of this, which is you have illicit networks, which are really networks engaged in criminal activity. These can be transnational. They can also be a co-offending network between juveniles in a high school that are engaged in some sort of small-scale drug distribution operation, right? It's a network that's engaged in criminal activity. But then you have organizations with their uh, different protocols, with their different leadership structures, with their different uh, abilities to reinforce the norms of that particular organization that are defined by a criminal enterprise or defined by that criminal activity. This is the drug trafficking organization. This is the uh, Beltran Levia organization. They're defined by that criminal activity. And then in contrast, you have illicit markets where the methods or the products of that particular market are criminal, but you have an interwoven capability of organizations and other networks that interface within that market. So this is the drug distribution market for El Paso. This is the opioid market for, um, uh, for uh, Tucson or for another environment, right? So the context here is that you have markets, organizations, and networks, and they're not all equivalent. I also want to highlight here, um, kind of a couple key definitions, because when we talk about disrupting and dismantling, we often are talking about two or three or four different concepts. First, disruption. And I like starting with the dictionary. That's what my mom used to make me do and says, you know, if you don't know a word, look it up, right? So when we look at disruption, disruption is really to interrupt in the normal course of, or unity of a particular function aspect. It's to interrupt. But disruptions can be adjusted, and disruptions can be recovered, and disruptions can be uh, met and, uh, and innovated against, and that disruption is only temporary. Then you have interdiction, which we're all very familiar with, which is the interception and prevention of the movement of a particular commodity or person. So you're actually intercepting and preventing that person or that commodity, but other commodities may get through. Other people may get through. It's that interdiction of that particular event and then you've got dismantlement, which we talk about and we see that we really want to dismantle TCOs. But if you look at the definition of dismantlement, dismantlement really means to disconnect the pieces of. So we talk about this from a network perspective, and we'll get onto this later on in the presentation. But we're talking about disconnecting networks and, dis and dismantling them. But that is contrasted to the concept of failure. If you look up here in failure, failure is the, a state of inability to perform a normal function. And I would argue that what we really want to do in countering TCOs is less to dismantle and disconnect because we all know that networks can splinter and carry on similar functions, right? They can splinter and carry on and become new networks and become new organizations. 
What we really want to focus on is how do these networks, how do these organizations, how do these markets fail till we get to an inability to carry out a normal function. And so that's what I want to highlight here in today's presentation. Now, this project that we did, and you're going to see results from this project referenced throughout the presentation, was a project we called the Failure Points Project, funded by a DHS component, um, and it was focused on trying to understand how transnational criminal organizations fail and what their mechanisms fail. So we're, we looked at a variety of things. We looked at their strategic behavior, right, that these organizations themselves not only are just transactions, but their strategies. How do they approach their supply chains? How do they approach issues when it came to reinforcing um, um, membership in the organization through violence and coercion? How do they approach concealment methods? What was their strategic gain and the strategic developments in this? But also looking at what we call the multiplex relationships, right? Now that's a, from, uh, that may be a new word, that may be a word to be less familiar with, but essentially that's the fact that any criminal network, any network, individuals have multiple types of relationships between a person. So you and I might have a criminal relationship where we work in the same enterprise, but we're brothers, right? Or we're family members. So there's two types of links and relationships there that can be drawn upon, whereas we might only have a criminal relationship. So our bond is stronger through a multiplex relationship, whereas our bond is only defined by our criminal enterprise. Or, from a failure perspective, our bond is weaker because you can screw me as my brother and you can screw me in the criminal enterprise, whereas you can only screw me from the criminal enterprise side. So really, it can work both ways in that context. And I don't know if I'm not allowed to say that word in an academic presentation, but you know, the, I'm sorry for the colorful language. But also, as part of this project was to document how these historic networks have failed and to go beyond just targeting leadership arrest, uh, interdiction, to really look at the entire network process, the entire organization process, to understand how they failed from issues that resulted both from interdiction and law enforcement efforts, but also issues that occurred within the network itself. And that's what I think one of the key findings that I want to highlight here. And then also is to identify those critical nodes, relationships, and processes which could have led to network failure. So this particular project was about trying to do a comparative analysis across a wide variety of different types of TCOs. Now, how many of you in the room work uh, target drug trafficking networks or are part of investigations against drug distribution and that concept? Kind of Raise your hand real quick. How many of you work on human smuggling networks or human trafficking networks? How many of you work on both? Okay. So, from those two perspectives, and there's a whole wide array of other networks we can talk about. Do the strategies that use to target a human trafficking network, target the financial infrastructure human trafficking network, to target the, uh, the norms and the ability to, in to infiltrate and or gain surveillance on there, also work when you're targeting a large-scale drug distribution network? In some cases, yes. But in some cases, no. And a lot of times, our experience, our approach to counter TCOs might be driven by those organizations and networks we're most familiar with. And so we take our strategy to target drug trafficking networks and we apply them to human trafficking networks. Or we get a wildlife case. We get a movement of illicit wildlife across the border and we say, well, they're going to operate just like a drug trafficking network because that's what I'm familiar with. And what we come to find out is, in some cases, yes, and in a lot of cases, no. So we wanted to maximize what we call that variation. So we looked at eight different networks, but across five commodities. We were assuming that there would be no similarities between these networks. That was our approach, that they're so varied and they're so wide scale, there would be no similarities. And so we had commodities like drugs and humans, but we also had exotic wildlife, arms, and even radiological and nuclear material. We'll talk about that in a second. And we also drew our sources. This was an unclassified open source study. It's meant so it can be shared and disseminated in that context. So we drew from court records, open source media, government reports, in some cases, people had done full-scale biographies and interviews with 100 individuals in that organization that they published as part of a book. And so we were able to leverage that information. But again, it has limitations. We'll talk about that. So what networks did we look at? I want to talk about it for a second. We looked at eight different networks. Two folks on drugs. One was a um, uh, cocaine importation network from Colombia that originally went to New York City and then started working through Miami when the interdiction increased in New York City. And this was an organization that um, operated from 1988 to 2006, so long term. And you'll see some of the dynamics of it in later slides. We also started a marijuana importation network uh, from Canada into the United States that actually worked with the Hells Angels. And then later on, 
developed a cocaine trafficking capability working with a member of the Sinaloa cartel in LA and facilitating that distribution throughout the United States and then distribution back into Canada. We also looked at two human smuggling networks and one of them ultimately became a trafficking network. Um, so we looked at a network called Sister Ping, which some of you may have heard about, uh, Chen Chuing Ping. If you remember 1984, there was a large boat that ran aground in New York City, 270 Chinese nationals, 14 died, that's Sister Ping's network. That was the golden venture. So you may remember that situation. We'll talk about that in a second. And then Soto Huerto, which was a small scale human smuggling network that actually is based out of Edinburgh uh, and, and essentially worked their way up through Falfurris and uh, up towards safe houses in Houston. But they later became a trafficking network. And so that actually was one of the things that ultimately led to their downfall. And we'll talk about that. We then looked at a wildlife trafficking network that operated out of the tri-border area within uh, uh, South America between um, uh, Paraguay, Brazil, and Argentina that moved illicit bir or, or, or exotic birds, not only just within the country, but had a whole distribution system to Amsterdam, to markets in Europe, and then birds back from Europe into Brazil for bi-directional wildlife. And they had OPSEC that you, that you would not imagine a wildlife trafficking network would have. They test run their technology through airport security. They actually developed vests where they could carry eggs through airport uh, x-ray machines that would then use the body warmth of the individual who's traveling there to keep the eggs warm as he's transiting on the airplane. And then they developed a, secret, a specialized bag that they brought on board that if one of those eggs hatched, it was an incubator that had a separate heat and oxygen source that they provided and put that hatched, hatchling in that could survive up to eight hours no sound, it was soundproofed that particular location. This was a bird network, right? But they use amazing operational capabilities and so we wanted to learn from that in that context. We then learned at, looked at Manzar al Qasar, which is uh, one of the uh, world's most notorious um, arms traffic. In fact, there was a recent, uh, uh, I guess, like uh, Discovery Channel special or uh, CNN or something to that effect on his actual operations. But he funded weapons to the PLO, to Somalia, he funded, he funded the, uh, he provided the uh, explosives for the uh, bombing in Argentina of the Jewish, uh, of the Jewish consulate down there. And so, uh, and the Jewish, uh, sorry, uh, cultural center that was down there in 94. He was Victor Bout before Victor Bout, right? If you've seen Lord of War in those uh, contexts. He survived 20, no, 37 years. And he was even in a, in a Paris magazine. He was so notorious, he was in a fashion magazine or a, a a lifestyle magazine out of France, right? But how was he ultimately interdicted? What led to his ultimate downfall? And we'll talk about that. And then two radiological and nuclear smuggling networks that operate out of Eastern Europe. In fact, the last one, the Wagner Ilyich um, one, led to the largest known uh, unclassified seizure of uh, highly enriched uranium, 2.73 kilograms of 90% enriched uranium, uh, uh, highly enriched uranium, um, which was the largest seizure to date in that context came from that network, and then the Dadian network, which is one of, I think, the world's only recidivist uh, nuclear smuggling network, and so we'll talk about that. But I like pictures, so what do these networks look like? What do these organizations look like? And they're varied. They're dramatically different from one to another. So up in the upper right, you've got the Dadian network, which is very sparse, only a few members and only weakly connected to a particular. In contrast, you've got the wildlife trafficking network that had two real clusters of operations connected through a few key individuals. And then you see the Alcazar network in the bottom right, centralized around that central node, which was Manzer Alcazar, and we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. From a drug smuggling network, not all drug trafficking networks look the same, as you know. The Canadian Importation Network was very decentralized, had a lot of players involved in it, whereas the Prada network was highly centralized around the key leader, Hernan Prada. And he had, if you notice, there's a cluster of individuals up in the upper right-hand corner that are only really connected to him, and I'll talk about that. That was his money laundering unit that eventually actually split off from him once he was arrested and carried on money laundering operations for another uh, three or four years after his arrest. And then we see the Sister Ping Network, which is a human smuggling uh, network. And then we see um, the Soto Huerto Network down in Edinburgh. And it looks like a strange star the way it's designed. It's because it's what we refer to as an all-channel network. It was a small cell where everyone knew everyone and worked with everyone. So in that context... It's really hard to disrupt a single node because everyone else knows everyone else. In other cases, it can be easy to flip someone and get intel on the network because everyone knows everyone else. So at this point, uh, we wanted to put a little Q&A. Any questions before we continue on? <laughs> 
If no questions, that's fine, but we wanted to provide an opportunity here. Okay. So what do we, what does science know? What do we know, what is science familiar with in this context? Most of the literature, most of the research on disrupting and dismantling TCOs has focused on this issue of targeting leadership. They actually term it in something called node removal, right? And removing a particular node. But there's lots of questions involved in this. There's lots of questions come when you're targeting leadership, right? So if we're talking about the arrest or killing of a key leader, right? How do you target? Who do you target? Is it applicable in all situations? How will networks respond? What's their processes for adapting to the removal of an individual? This is one thing that science has invested a fair amount of resources in, but I would argue that it's been limited by the available data that they have. But before we get down there, I want to introduce some concepts in networks. Now, how many of you in this room have ever seen a link diagram? Most of your hands should raise up, right? It's like, how many of you have ever seen a pin map on a, on a sector wall, something to that effect, right? We're all familiar with it. We see links. <laughs> And when we look at link diagrams, we think the person in the center, that's the key leader, that's who we should go with, right? But I want to walk you through some concepts that are familiar in the scientific perspective about identifying who is that most central individual, who is that leader. This is application. So when we talk about it first, we want to talk about how are networks structured. In one case, you have networks that might be a chain. You might be familiar, this might be a particular smuggling chain. And individuals are only connected to the next person on that chain. There is no um, connections elsewhere. In this context, you remove one link from that chain, and that supply chain is unable to continue on. You also have what we call star or hub networks. That's a central person who is the person that's connected to everyone else, right? That's what we usually think about. Right in the middle, there's your central individual. And then we have what we call all-channel networks, right, which are actually pretty rare in context. But that's the that's Soto Huerto network we see. Everyone knows everyone else. There is no fully central individual because everyone knows everyone else. Now, networks are not just defined yes or no of one of these categories. Networks can actually contain all three of these in different aspects of the network. So you can have some part of the network that's a hub where one person is a central node and he connects a lot of people and other aspects that are more chain-like where it's one role connection to another connection to another within the same network. And so we talk about what is the, who should we target, who should we disrupt, who should we surveil or arrest in that particular context. You've got various uh, answers that can be offered based on where you look in the network. But one of the ways that analysts, if you, if you are an analyst or you have analysts that work in your organization, one of the things they're going to do is they're going to take that link diagram, they're going to run some analysis, and they're going to say, who's the most central node? But what I'm going to argue is that centrality, which is a concept, and sorry, you know, my voice is... Uh, uh, starting to go, but <clears throat> this concept of centrality is not something that everyone agrees on the same definition. And depending upon what method you use, you get a different answer. Let's talk about this. So there's something called degree centrality. Now again, we're going to have lots of pictures here because I'm a big fan of pictures uh, and I'm trying to avoid as much text as possible. So degree centrality. So that person in the middle, that blue node, would be the most central because he's connected or she's connected to the most people. So from a centrality perspective, you look at the degree, the number of connections to that particular individual. Person with the highest number of connections has the highest degree centrality. Everyone tracking with that so far? Now, another measure is called closeness. Forget about who's connected to the most people. It's really about how close is a particular individual to everyone else in the network. So in this case, person in the middle is most, is, most, is most central because they can reach everyone in the network in the fewest hops. They're the most close person in the entire network. Not because they're connected to the most people, but they can reach the most people. Or they can reach in the, in the shortest amount of hops. Another measure is called betweenness, right? You might hear this referred to as brokers. That it's not about who's connected to the most people. It's who mediates, who's connecting particular relationships between other nodes, other actors. So in this context, the most central person is the person that mediates communication between all the other nodes, or as many of the other nodes as possible. So in this diagram, so far, the central person has been the same individual, but you can imagine your own networks, your own link diagrams, where the person that is most central from a degree perspective may not be most central from a betweenness perspective. 
And that might change your targeting strategy, your investigation strategy, approaching that particular network. Now, another aspect of networks to talk about is clustering. You'll notice up here that you have, in this particular network, you have really two clusters that form, cluster A and cluster B. We'll call it the green cluster and the blue cluster, right? That most of our relationships, most relationships in networks tend to be clustered. You tend to be friends with other people who are also friends with the same people, right? You tend to work with other people, and because you all work together, there's a cluster of relationships amongst those you work with. So clusters are very natural in our social networks, and they emerge in a lot of criminal networks as well. But one thing that I want to highlight here is this concept, building upon that, it's not just about clustering, it's about another concept called small worlds. Now, small worlds, like, was that like, you know, it's a small world, Disneyland type thing? No. Small worlds here really defines the fact that you have lots of clusters in social networks around the world, on Facebook, in your particular listen network that you're looking at, whatever the case may be, but there are bridges. There are individuals. There are a number of bridges that bridge these clusters. Remember, it's not about bridging two nodes at this point. It's about being a bridge between two clusters. Now, why is this important? Because you've, or, you've already been exposed to this. This is six degrees of Kevin Bacon or six degrees of separation, right? You're familiar with this concept. What this means, though, is that you have an ability to reach many other people in a few hops. The whole science behind six degrees of separation is because we have naturally cluster relationships, but key bridges between those clusters. Illicit networks are not necessarily different. So you may target a particular cluster, you may find a key leader in a particular cluster, but then you realize that that cluster is also connected to, by a bridge to another cluster. And so instead of targeting that cluster, you want to find that bridge that connects those two clusters. They might be two different functions in an organization. It might be two different groups, two different cells in a particular network. So you want to find those bridges because that's the person that connects a number of people together, the clusters together in this particular network. The last thing I want to highlight from just a conceptual perspective is something called the key player problem. This is another strategy. So forget about finding who's most connected. Forget about finding who bridges networks. We want to find the individual that if we removed, fragments the network, breaks apart the network the most effectively. So if we go back to the slide, that central individual is your most relevant individual because he fragments or she fragments the network into two separate. But if we take it one step further, if we don't just focus on that one person, we find that there are three more nodes that if we removed, we would essentially make this network a bunch of isolates, a bunch of isolated individuals that don't have connections between them. So what we end up with is four individuals that we would want to target for surveillance, for arrest, for disruption, for flipping, whatever strategy you want to approach because they are the individuals that most connect the network. So you can target the most connected, you can target the one that is between the most cells, or, or otherwise referred to as brokers. You can target those who are maybe the kingpin, who you think you know, ideally are the key leader from your own qualitative in, insights, or you can target those that most connect the components of the network. So that's all the concepts I'm gonna throw at you for right now, right? So, don't worry, that's, that, that, end, that, that ends the lesson for, for today. But let's talk about this in application. I showed you eight networks that we studied, right? You saw the link analysis you're all familiar, familiar with, right? The question is, who to target? So we tried these four studies. We tried these four approaches, and we'll talk about that. But you, it really depends on who you consider to be a leader. Is a leader the manager of the organization, the person who's at head, the kingpin maybe? Or is it the broker that connects multiple components of that particular transnational criminalization together? Is it a facilitator? Maybe it's the individual that gains access for that in particular network to key transportation crews that can smuggle the product and provide multiple routes that the individual can pass through. Who do you target also depends on how you construct the network. And this is relevant to one of your questions on your post-test, right? Does it matter how you construct the network for identifying the key leader? Absolutely, yes. When you look at organizational relationships, right? So this is, this person gives money to this person, this person provides the dope to that person. When you look at those organizational relationships, usually 
the most central individuals were also identified by law enforcement as the key leaders, right? So that centrality matters, that who's the key leaders. But if you use a call network, if you use a wiretap, cell phone records, work that's been done in Italy looking at mafia, work that's been done in a variety of other contexts finds that the identified key leaders were actually peripheral to the network. They weren't the most central. It makes sense, this is common sense. The key leader is not the one that's coordinating the uh, particular um, uh, connections from a call center. Thank you very much, Chief. <laughs> Appreciate that. The key leader is not the one that's facilitating the communication that's going on between the transport crew and the suppliers and things that affect. They're providing the directive, but it's that broker or it's that sub-manager that carries out that particular task. So if you use a call network, you're going to get one key leader. If you use an organization, you're going to get another key leader. So the answer really is, well, it depends. Depends on what you want to target. Depends on what you want to go through. And I see some people got the right answer, right? Actually, that's my favorite answer. My students know it all because life's so complex. It, it depends. So who to target? Well, also remember that not all networks are the same. We've talked about this, right? But that... Many studies, again, what does the science say? How well does this align with your own experience? Have found that drug trafficking networks tend to be highly centralized around a few key leaders and then lots of loose connections. This might be so that they can drop a crew if they get interdicted and not have a lot of connections with that particular crew. This could be that they try to insulate themselves from being, um, being able to have someone roll up on them or being able to be flipped. But it also allows them to scale and, and adapt quickly but we'll talk about some of those limitations on adaptation. But in some cases, we all know those large networks that persist for years. They, they persist, they keep operating, they're flexible, they adapt, they innovate. But in other markets, in other networks, in other contexts, there really isn't a central network. It's really a bunch of temporary agreements between dealers and brokers and suppliers that last for a few months and then they switch and they go do something else. And it becomes this kind of very dynamic and very short-lived network structure. So what context you're looking at, what networks you're approaching, what organizations you're trying to disrupt, will all have an impact on what strategy you choose. And so what we talked about in those eight networks that we looked at, we wanted to test this. We wanted to simulate this, right? Sorry. <clears throat> we wanted to see which one of these strategies worked best, right? Which one of these strategies had the most impact on trying to disrupt or fragment the network. So we tested four. We call it the kingpin, that key leader, the central leader of that network, the person you're going after, right? Talk about degree centrality. Remember, who's most connected? We use between the centrality. Remember, the brokers. Who's brokering relationships between individuals? And then we target what's called the key player measure, which is about who most connects the network. So any questions on this so far before I go forward? The kind of the four strategies. Everyone following along? Okay. Now, how fragmented should the network be? How, how disrupted do you want the network to be? If you fragment 20% of the links in the network, maybe the network carries on. Maybe now you've created two networks that are more adaptive, right? So we wanted to test this out to kind of what we'll call a strategy of obliteration, right? We want to obliterate 90% of the links in the network, right? Again, it's a simulation. So what happened? What would be the best strategy? So I like pictures, as I mentioned. So if we took the kingpin approach, target the number one key leader that we, look, that we found through investigation files, court records, things like that. Who's the most central? And we set the threshold at 90%, very high, right? Some networks, this worked great. Manzer al Qasar, as I mentioned, that arms trafficker, he was, he was very smart. One of the reasons he survived is he never rarely used the same transportation crew twice. He would create one-off orders of very large weapons transfers for particular um, clients. And he rarely used the same transportation crew and he only had a few key suppliers that he randomly, that he rotated throughout in order to supply the weapons. He insulated himself by having few connections or few connections between members in his organization, but he was also the most central leader. So because he was the most central leader, you take Kassar out you fragment 96% of the links in the network. So if you take a kingpin strategy for that arms trafficking network, boom, works wonders, right? And we saw that. But for other networks, it doesn't work so well. 
The Stewart Network, which is a drug importation network from Canada, connecting Hells Angels, connecting a variety of other organizations that were moving marijuana and, and into the United States across the northern border through Blaine Sector, I, imagine, I believe. You only disrupted, if you took out that key leader, you only took out about 20% of the links. So if you take the kingpin approach and you apply it to all these networks, it doesn't work the same in each network. That should register a question of duh, right? That's common sense. You need to tailor your interdiction strategies. So we want to explore this a little further. And this is just a visual representation to show you how some networks are more centralized and suffer and will be more susceptible to a king pin strategy and others won't. But remember, we're not just testing remove the key leader. We want to look at removing based upon who's most connected, the brokers, and who most connect the network. So we tested across this. We said how many people would have to be removed to get to that 90% fragmentation. For some, the Dadian network, the wildlife trafficking network, and the Kassar network took two people to get to 90%. But in other more decentralized networks like the Stewart network, like the cocaine importation network, you had to remove five, six, seven individuals, depending upon which method you use, to disrupt and fragment that network. And if any of you have worked in these particular investigations, you know that that's a hell of a lot of people to try to remove. It's a hell of a lot of people to build cases against, to arrest, to disrupt, to investigate, right? So that 90% threshold, regardless of the methodology you use, for more complex networks, it can take a lot more individuals. And so this is the point in the presentation to say, well, I feel dejected. Why did you invite me here to talk about disrupting and dismantling? Because I like to say, okay, what's feasible? So let's take that last approach. Remember, we're talking about removing the most connected. But this approach works on the degree, the removing the most, uh, the, sorry, removing those that most connect the network. It also works on removing brokers and removing uh, the most connected. So we take this. You remove one, this is what it looks like. Steward network, you're not really moving a lot of people. Cassar network, you're moving a lot. But let's say we just move that one step further. You remove the two individuals that most connect the network. Or in another strategy, the two individuals that are the key brokers. Or in another strategy, the two individuals that are most connected. It doesn't really matter what methodology you do. The two individuals that most connect the network. And what you end up getting is you don't reach this optimal fragmentation point, but you get pretty damn close. And what you find is that a new, what we'll call feasible fragmentation point emerges. Regardless of the network that we had. Now again, this is eight networks. The question of how generalizable this is, brings up a lot of questions. But these are also eight very different networks, very different structures, very different commodities. Across these eight networks, you remove the two key individuals simultaneously, right? Fragmented about 60% of the network right off the bat. Now, is that something that you could adopt as a law enforcement approach? That's much more feasible than trying to remove seven, eight, nine, ten individuals in a single swoop across a variety of networks. So just moving from one to two. Now this also makes sense from another perspective. Think about it, you remove the kingpin. Kingpin's arrested, Chapo goes down, uh, you know, uh, Z40 or a variety of other individuals go down, particularly networks in Mexico, what happens? There's a contestation, a fight for leadership, a new person emerges, right? But what happens if you take the top two leaders down? What happens in that context? You start to have questions about, is there a third person to replace? Is there someone that can step in? Or is that such a deterrent that they want to choose another pathway? Maybe they splinter or whatever the case. So you get to a point where just moving from one to two creates such a valuable difference regardless of the commodity and regardless of the network in this limited study. So we talk about this. We want to move beyond kingpins, right? And this is actually work that I'm working with on uh, some uh, colleague of mine in Canada. We want to move beyond kingpins so that we remove more than just the key leader. Let's move from one to two at a minimum. But also, let's also look at our networks from a different perspective. Second, no one approach fits all, though, for optimizing. If you want to reach that 90% threshold, you got to tailor your interdiction strategy, right? you got to tailor your approach and that more complex networks require more removal. But again, the science has primarily been on removing key leaders from a network perspective. This is where the science has been. But how do we move beyond that? One thing that's out there, I talk about 
moving beyond this. There's a lot of work that's developing from a network science perspective. So this concept of weak nodes is actually very interesting. Uh, researchers, I believe from Italy, found, they analyzed the call networks of 400,000 people in some unnamed European country that gave them the call network data, right? These are not illicit networks, right? But these are the call records, right? They found that the most influential nodes, the people who connected most of those people were not the brokers, they were not the most central individuals, they were these weak nodes, these people that weren't really connected to a lot of people, but they were connected to important people. So they were this weak link between two really important people. And that was who, if you removed that node, you actually fragmented the network pretty effectively. So maybe we need to push and find maybe weak nodes might be another opportunity within these organizations. There's also this concept that we looked at organizations, but markets are actually much more resilient to disruption. Dutch intelligence, that first study there, and again, I have all the references at the end of the slide, so if you want to follow up and look this up afterwards, uh, you'll be able to do that, anything in the slide. But markets are more resilient. We know this. You take out an organization, the market, the demand and the supply may still be there, the market responds. But he actually found that markets are much more susceptible to splintering, and maybe that improves the ability to monitor that particular market or identify new organizations that need to be monitored uh, in that particular environment. And, there's, and then there's this other concept. This is from work looking at a heroin trafficking network that criminal networks don't operate by having the most central individuals connected to the most central individuals. So this is not what is termed assortive, right? This is not Beyonce with Jay-Z, right? The most connected individual and the most connected individual coming together. Criminal networks often work in a different paradigm, which is that the most connected individual is connected to many weakly connected individuals. Now that creates an ins the insulation layer, right? If they're weakly connected, they don't have lots of information on lots of other people. That's an insulation boundary. What might it mean to re-examine that distortive nature of that network? And that study took a look at fragmenting and disrupting based upon that approach. And that what does it mean to have a, a, a criminal network where the most highly connected individuals are connected to weakly connected nodes? So again, this is where the science is moving, but this is where this, this is just new. This is not something that's currently been tested. And this might not even been tested on, in a lot of these cases, on actual illicit network data, which is one of the things that's a key gap in the environment. So now I want to move on to another aspect of this, which is about what science mostly knows, about this question of adaptation. Because we really want to know that when we interdict a criminal network, what is the adaptation? going to be? How are they going to respond? We all know they respond, but what processes do they respond? So illicit organizations are constantly in a need to adapt. They constantly need to maintain security and efficiency, right? You want to get the most commodity through without blowing your cover. You want to facilitate the most illegal enterprise without being detected. So you take state strategies to uh, improve your security, but it might hinder your efficiency. And you take things to improve your efficiency, but it might hinder your security. There's a balance. But this balance requires a lot of adaptation. Because let's be honest, sometimes criminal networks are made up of dumb criminals, right? That do stupid things. That forget to, you know, register their vehicles at the DMV and get pulled over for expired license plate tags, right? So there's always this constant need for adaptation, and it's recurrent. Criminal networks are always ad adapting, right? And so one of the things that you're very familiar with is that these adaptations reveal a lot about that particular network. Shipments get interdicted. Demand escalates. Remember, it's not just from interdiction. You also have new markets open and others close. How have organizations shifted from marijuana to meth to fentanyl? Right? What have been those new markets opening? How criminal organizations take advantage of them? But also, depending upon law enforcement addiction, depending on what strategies we adopt, those adaptations are somewhat limited. There's only so many ways they can adapt. You arrest an individual, oftentimes they either replace them or they find another way to get around to not having that individual. You interdict a shipment, they send another one or they send multiple knowing that you're going to interdict at least one or two, or five. You close a route, they find an alternative path. 
So we want to look at this across those eight networks, right? What commonalities did we see in these eight networks when we looked at the individual cases? And what we find is going to confirm a lot of things that you already know. How do they adapt? When interdiction, when a, someone was arrested, when a shipment was interdicted, when a route was closed, how did they adapt? It's very common. They develop new concealment methods. This makes sense, right? They develop new ways of packaging their materials, new ways of concealing their particular shipments. They change shipment pro processes rather than shipping uh, via, you know, a... Uh, a cargo shipping container on an ocean-going vessel. They did another. They did a a, 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 a rope-a-dope kind of configuration. They did a variety of other mechanisms to conceal their particular uh, shipment. They also improved security protocols. There's a great example of this in the Stewart network, where an individual was interdicted because he used an encrypted BlackBerry communication technology when communicating with his network in Canada, and for whatever reason, an unencrypted regular cell phone communicating with his U.S.-based network. Same individual, two different protocols for security. Guess what made him vulnerable to interdiction, right? He didn't apply that same protocol across. So improved security protocols. They also compartmentalize functions. So again, that cocaine importation network that was moving from Columbia originally to New York City, which was the Prada network in the late 80s, there was a number of seizures that happened against that particular network. But the leader, Hernan Prada, was part of those shipments. He was with those shipments on a variety of bases. You know what he did in response? What you would do in response, right? He insulated himself. He said, ah, I'm not going with these shipments anymore, right? I'm going to find somebody who can go with these shipments, and I'm going to separate myself and compartmentalize that function to protect my leadership, to protect me. They ship operations to new routes, right? They move to new routes, new locations to optimize that. They went from the Dominican pathway to the Mexico pathway. Then when Mexico shuts down, they go back to the Dominican pathway. They go through a variety of ways to optimize those routes. Sister Ping, the human smuggling network, this is very fascinating. Thai officials worked with U.S. law enforcement. Sister Ping was shipping individuals through the uh, Bangkok airport in Thailand, 92-93. And had a huge supply because we had an act that allowed Chinese nationals to gain asylum in the country because of Tiananmen Square, because of what had been going down in China in the 1990s, or late 80s and early 90s. So there was a huge demand for Chinese nationals to, be, to, to come to the United States and try to seek asylum, try to um, uh, uh, um, illegally immigrate into the country. And so what happened was they had a very good thing going. They had someone they bought off at the Thai airport, who was doing the inspections, or the visa inspections, the way in. They had fake visas as well, in case someone else was different there. But then U.S. law enforcement, Thai law enforcement, caught on. You know what they did in 92? They randomized their shifts for that particular port inspection, right? They randomized their shift for that visa inspector. What happened was the person who they known, the route and the time frame that they had no longer was there. So that airport was now closed off to them. So they adapted. They worked with other snakeheads in China to put together a large shipment of 270 individuals from Fujian province in China, put them on a container vessel, and send them westward to Kenya, and then down around the Cape of Good Hope, and then up to West Africa, and then to New York City. So they operated as a way to try to adapt and find a new route in order to adjust. And they also shift operations towards new priorities. As I mentioned, that Prada network, the cocaine importation network, when the leader of that, when Prada was actually arrested, that network persisted because it shifted operations from cocaine trafficking to money laundering, which they had a very effective operation going on. And that lasted, I think, five years, six years after he was finally arrested. Now, I want to pause here for a second because I think we sometimes give TCOs too much credit. We often assume that they always optimize and work rationally, right? That they always are going to adapt effectively, right? Because we've been in those situations where they do something and we're like, damn, I wish I would have known how they were going to innovate. I wish I would have understood that new concealment method. And so we say they're always going to rationally adapt and to whatever is so they're always adapting and innovating. But you know what? We actually found across the data networks that there were lots of inabilities or failures to adapt. They didn't always adapt effectively. They weren't the 
Walmart supply chain optimization framework for adjusting the TCOs and interdiction efforts, they were human beings who have errors and make misjudgments. And we'll talk about in the second session how some of these misjudgments could be used to provoke the network to fail rather than just interdict. So what do we find? Sometimes they had a structural inability to adapt. That small nuclear smuggling network I showed you, when one of those guys was interdicted, guess what? There's not many people left to respond. When a key broker was removed, there was not a steady supply of qualified trained brokers to respond to them. Another thing we found was there was a temporal incapacity to adapt. One of the interesting things we found in the actual study was that the interdiction process varied across networks and varied within each network. So you think interdiction, right? You think a lot of strategies that are often used, you gather all the evidence, you identify all the key leaders, and then you, you do a massive roll up at the end, right? You arrest 20, 30, 40, 60 members, 100 members, you have a nationwide roll up of particular networks to arrest them all at once. We'll call that a rapid dissolution. What this actually worked was, even when it was part, wasn't part of a strategy like that, this allowed or prevented networks to have time to respond. Because the other thing is, we always assume, we often assume that networks are, have a steady supply of immediately available individuals to respond, but this was not the case. It took time to bring the individuals into the network, and when there was a interdiction after interdiction after interdiction after interdiction, there wasn't enough time to respond. So that's an optimal, that's a strategy, an interdiction strategy that could be taken and utilized for this purpose. But then we also had this other thing that I want to highlight. We'll call it strategic miscalculations. And what this is, is the network was operating in a rational fashion. They were making a judgment, responding to an interdiction. But rather than always being successful in that response, it was a strategic error. It was a miscalculation. So let's go back to that choice of new locations, new pathways. You had an interdiction that happened against one of the networks that disrupted the key pathway for that particular network. And what ended up happening was that network pathway was interdicted. They tried to find an alternate route, but that alternate route they were less familiar with. When you're less familiar with, you don't do the background security checks, and you don't do the background investigation to see who's monitoring, what's on that pathway, where are law enforcement, what's your security vulnerabilities. So they chose a different pathway, and that ultimately led to their disruption. A great example of this is actually that human smuggling and trafficking network in Edinburgh, Texas. They had a stash house in Edinburgh that they were operating out of, and they were moving, again, this is the court records that stated about 100 legal immigrants per week across the border, that particular network. Small network, eight guys, right? So they had a stash house. But then that stash house got raided. In fact, it got raided, surprisingly, because the network switched from a human smuggling network to a human trafficking network. The leader of the network took and said to the leaders of that, to the other members of the network, that he's going to take four of the girls that he has smuggled across and keep them as sex slaves. And then he beat them, and then he asked the, the, the members of the networks to take one of those women and take them out to the desert and kill them because they were being disobedient. And the other members of the network said, yo, this is what we signed up for. This is not what we agreed to. We were just a smuggling organization moving people across the border. We are not going to kill someone. So they actually took the woman out, you know, in not wearing hardly any clothes, and left her out in the middle of the desert. She flagged down a car, went to a police station. She knew exactly where the stash house was in Edinburgh. So that drew the police and allowed them to raid the stash house. But luckily, some of the members weren't there. Well, not luckily, but for that organization. So you know how they responded? They said, we need to find a new stash house, right? But you got time. You've got pressures ticking on you. So what do you do? We're going to do the Motel 6. We're going to operate out of the Motel 6, right? Not really wise. Too much vulnerability, too much visibility, you know, controlled access issues. So they went to the Motel 6. They had a smaller part of the network. They went to the Motel 6. There was a traffic stop right outside the Motel 6 of six of them in a car with three of the women that they had. And that led to the network being fully dismantled and, and led to network failure. But it started with a strategic miscalculation after their stash house was raided. Again, they don't seek another stash house, they went to Motel 6. They don't always operate, operate optimally and efficiently. And then a choice of new partners. So we're gonna talk about this in the second section, but there, in session, session, but one of the drug importation networks, Stute Network, DEA had them under surveillance, they were working with them, and DEA found a courier that they were able to flip. 
And they, was a, there was a movement of about a million and a half dollars in drug proceeds from Iowa back to uh, Washington. So they interdicted this courier, a million and a half dollars, and they said, either you flip for us, or you're going go to you know, you're gonna spend a long time in jail. So he flipped. They conjured up a fake police report saying that the car had been impounded, right, or the car had been seized, and then the courier went back in to the network as an informant. That particular courier said, listen, the money's gone. What do we do? So that network had to respond in such a way they had to make up that million and a half dollars in a week to be able to repay the debts that they had. So they started to ramp up their cocaine importation processes and shifted from something you're very familiar with, which is marijuana, to cocaine. Well, they didn't know cocaine as well. They didn't know the processes. They didn't know the markets as well. They didn't know the security operations. Guess what you need to do? We need a new partner. Hey, Courier's got this new agent here, or this new, this new partner. His name's Bob. Don't mind the DEA badge he has on, right? So it provided an opportunity for infiltration, not because the network was initially vulnerable, but because it was provoked and prodded, and in the response to that, led to a miscalculation strategically for the network. So how can we take advantage of this as we move forward into our particular operations? And we're going to talk a little bit about that in the second half of the session. But at this point, I want to leave some time for Q&A. Questions you might have, comments. Um, yeah, that's all BS. I don't know what you're talking about. You know, critiques, open to it. First question, there you go. Okay, yeah. <laughs> With developing all these networks, We're actually going to get into the role-based aspect in the second half of the session when we talk about network versus supply chain resilience. So I'm going to save the answer for that. But those networks, when we did a lot of the analysis, we looked at the multiplex relationships. So we looked at there was a financial tie between these two individuals. I lent money to you or I funneled money through you. There's also a familial tie. There was a potential if we also operated and cooperated a legitimate front business, there was another tie there. So there were multiple layers of ties that we analyzed in a multiplex network framework that we accounted for. As far as geography goes, imagine you're probably talking about kind of the distance that is often pervaded between these particular networks, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah so geography can actually uh, give a limitation to how an organization operates. Especially when your transport crew is based in the Dominican Republic and you're operating out of Colombia, right? So we did take a look at some of the geographic clustering of some of these particular networks, and that changed the network structure to some degree, but ultimately didn't have a, res a, a, a strong effect on the fragmentation results that I showed you earlier. It was roughly equivalent when we took the ge geography into a side, into the decision about strength of those ties between individuals. We got a lot more clustering geographically, but you also still have the same fragmentation potential uh, from the uh, different types of ways of disrupting that network. A great question. Other questions? I got a question. Yeah. So at the beginning when you were showing the uh, comparative graphs between the different networks, we left off the all family plot. <coughs> yeah. Can you explain that? Boy, there's a lot of slides here. You guys are patient people. <laughs> this one? No, the, the, where it shows the fragmentation. Oh, the fragmentation, right? So I left off the all channel. I was waiting for someone to pick that up. So one of the reasons I left off the all channel, what? He gets a challenge score for that. I mean, ah, oh, okay. So one of the reasons I left that off is one of the challenges you have with an all channel network, the same challenge you have with a small cell organization, is that because everyone works and knows with everyone else, it's very difficult to fragment one part of that network without fragmenting the entire network itself. So in this context, removing one individual simultaneously, depending upon how you remove that individual. If you take them out, the organization, everyone else still remains with everyone else. You really haven't fragmented much of the network at all. But if you take that out and flip that person, so we're not talking about fragmenting, we're talking about using that to gather information, now you've got information on everyone. So from the mathematical process of that modeling, you get kind of results that don't mean anything when you apply that approach to an all-channel network. So the same approach happens if you have a small cell of a large organization and you apply this approach. If everyone knows everyone else in a small cell, don't use a fragmentation method to try to target key leadership. Figure out 
who has the connections to everyone else that you want to flip for informant and, and take an approach like that. From this methodology, the results we got were, depending on how you interpret them, either zero fragmentation or 100% fragmentation if you were going to flip them versus remove them from the network. Does that make sense? So that's where the limitations of that approach, right? But guess what? That's a great opportunity for science to say, what other mathematical approaches are out there, right? That we could apply for all channel networks that could give you that kind of inside information to target those particular networks. But the frequency of all channel networks like that amongst TCOs, depending upon which type of TCOs you're looking at, and TCNs and, and kind of that approach, either is very frequent because they're all small cell human smuggling groups, five, six, seven individuals, and then something like this may not be as appropriate. You might be looking at more at a market analysis, right, or something that's effect. Or they're very infrequent because it's a, it's a large-scale organization, and there might be clusters here and there, but lots of other bridges between. I hope that answers your question. Other questions? Observation? Yeah. A lot of the TCO that you're talking about here is 10 years old, maybe? Right. And it seems that during the adaptive process, we're starting to see more of the brokering as opposed to sales. In other words, I don't know who the dope belongs to. I don't know how I got here. But I know that my job is to get it to X, Y, or Z. Right. So I think that's something that is eventually going to come up here, and we'll see a class in three years from now saying how this is impacting the organization. Well, you actually already made my point for the end of the presentation. So we're done. No. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, but, uh, but you're absolutely right. One of the reasons why these organizations are old is in order to do a study on this, we had to wait for not just the network to be discovered, but the network to be discovered, prosecuted, appealed, closed, court case, final court records before we could even start taking a look at it. So imagine what this can be done because not only are you highlighting that, but the, what's not accounted for in here is the rapid growth in communication structures and how communication structures through social media, through Telegram, through WhatsApp, whatever the case may be, compared to call networks, compared to organizational networks, leads you to a whole new dimension of where to target and disrupt. But there is a gap there in that the amount of researcher-practitioner partnerships is missing in the counter-TCO um, uh, arena. And that's what I'm hoping to encourage more efforts in. So you've already made my point for me, but I'm going to call on you when we get to that section. Because there's, I mean, we're talking about financial stuff. I mean, what you don't, I mean, we looked at financial relationships, where the money flowed within there as part of the network structure, but we don't include in there, we don't have a financial transaction network, right? We don't actually have the ledgers. We had some drug ledgers when we had um, in some of the drug trafficking networks, but again, a lot of those ledgers were included in the, course docu in the court documents and then removed from the publicly available court documents for a variety of reasons. I mean, you hit on it right there that there is a gap in this knowledge. That's why what I'm presenting to you today, conceptually, and the approach has a lot of benefit of how we can move that science forward, but it's still a gap. So what can we do to close that gap? Not me to close that gap for you, but together. What operational questions do you face that you're not seeing in this stuff? And again, this represents some more of the cutting edge research on criminal networks that are available in the, under, uh, in the unclass open source environment. So how can we push this forward? It's not going to be me sitting up here coming to you in three years with that class. It's going to say, let's work together. What questions do you have? How can we use techniques? Because there is a realm of mathematicians, network scientists, researchers that have the skill sets, but the data is lacking. And we have to take a year and a half to reconstruct all this information from court records and code this person, this person, and employ an army of graduate students and army of graduate students to do it. But I think there's an opportunity there. You've already made my point.